Welcome to the chapters 11 and 12 in the Human Biology textbook. Um, today we're going to be talking about the nervous system and the sensory mechanisms that go along with it. So uh, these two are very big chapters. Obviously, as always, we're focusing on very specific information here, uh, not everything that the author actually discusses in the textbook. So when we're talking about the nervous system, we're talking about the system that allows communication throughout the body, sending electrochemical signals such as neurotransmitters, to allow those messages to be transmitted, to allow the organs to be controlled and uh, managed throughout the body. The structure of the nervous system is separated into the central nervous system, CNS, and the peripheral nervous system, PNS. For the central nervous system, we basically divide it into the brain and the spinal cord. The brain consists of uh, multiple separate structures separated into the cerebral cortex or the cerebrum, cerebellum, and the midbrain. The cerebrum is most of that structure that you think of the brain. The cerebellum is the portion all the way in the back, and the midbrain uh, is the deeper kind of inner portion, uh, also connected to the brainstem, which ultimately goes into the spinal cord. So most of the things we're going to talk about today here will be dealing with the cerebral cortex or the cerebrum. Now, when you separate the cerebrum, into different parts, we call these lobes. So there's frontal lobe, parietal lobes, temporal lobes, occipital lobes. Frontal lobes are in the front, parietal uh, kind of upper and sort of back portion, all the way in the back is the occipital lobe, and on the sides are the temporal lobes. When you're gonna look at the pictures of the brain uh, in the book, you're gonna see basically the way we separate these, we say that in the frontal lobe, we have the executive functions, such as reasoning, problem solving, personality, language control, and other centers for the higher level um, processing. Parietal lobes, those further back primarily deal with control of sensory information. Temporal lobes on the side deal with hearing and balance information processing. And occipital lobes in the back deal with vision or eyesight information processing. Again, frontal lobes deal with executive functions. Parietal lobes deal with sensory information. Temporal lobes deal with hearing and balance, and occipital lobes deal primarily with vision. Uh, for the cerebellum, just very briefly, that deals with coordination of movement and balance. Again, it's a smaller kind of portion all the way in the back, lower than the occipital lobe. And the midbrain has all kinds of different centers, things like thalamus, hypothalamus, parts of the limbic system, and the uh, brain stem that control everything from cardiovascular function to respiratory function. And... Uh, endocrine system with its hormones. Now, when we talk about the spinal cord, essentially spinal cord extends out from the brainstem, continues through the spinal column, and sends out its spinal nerves to become peripheral nerves throughout the body. Peripheral nerves can be subdivided into motor neurons and sensory neurons. Motor neurons are those that control muscular function or movements, whether these are voluntary or involuntary movements. Again, motor means movement. So thinking about like controlling muscles, either in the digestive system or like musculoskeletal system for regular skeletal voluntary muscles. These would be controlled by motor neurons. And then all the rest of the information is sent through the sensory neurons, such as information for eyesight or hearing or smell or sense of touch. Any kind of sensory input must travel through the sensory neurons. Uh, not to forget also is that we have something called neuroglial cells, which are the support cells of the nervous system. Keep in mind that neurons are very large cells that do not really have time or ability to provide even the basic nutrition or physical support for themselves or cannot remove waste or protect themselves. All of that separate important functions are dealt by the neuroglial cells, such as microglia, oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, or many other support cells. Again, they are regular cells in the body. They are not neurons. Again, they do not communicate or send information. They are cells that are there to support and provide physical nutrition, and other kind of help and assistance to the neurons. Uh, very important aspect, uh, thinking about the nervous system, is to continue to kind of separate into different domains in different ways one very important one is language processing. So language processing is found actually in two parts of the brain on the left side primarily. So the frontal lobe deals with uh, something called the Broca's area, which controls production of speech. 
And in the temporal lobe, again on the left side, we have Wernicke's area, which also controls language, specifically understanding of speech. So again, two areas of the brain, at least, that deal with language processing is the left frontal and left temporal lobes. Another system that's really important here to recognize uh, is the limbic system. This is the one that controls memory processing. So acquisition of memories, storage of long-term or short-term memories. Two important aspects of the limbic system anatomically is the hippocampus and the amygdala. Both of those are located deep inside the temporal lobes. Hippocampus specifically deals with uh, acquisition of memories, so kind of trying to put them into long-term storage. And amygdala is there to associate emotions with memories, fears and memories and other kind of similar aspects like that. So the best way to think of amygdala is when you're like essentially thinking of uh, something that happened very pleasant, let's say, or maybe unpleasant in your childhood. You have an emotional connection to those memories. That's where an amygdala kind of lights up. The next portion here, the neurotransmitters. Again, remember, for a typical neuron, which consists of the cell body and the dendrites, these extensions, the cell body contains the nucleus of all its organelles. It has this long extension called the axon. The axon is the one that actually transmits the electrochemical information. The chemical portion of it is these small molecules, neurotransmitters like acetylcholine, serotonin, GABA, and dopamine. There are many different types of neurotransmitters that have been discovered. I'm going to talk about only these four for now. Acetylcholine should be already familiar to you. This is the one we talked about in the musculoskeletal system. This is the one that excites the skeletal muscles to actually start the process of contraction when the motor neuron connects to the muscle and excites it. But acetylcholine also found in memory processing, learning, and the control of other centers in the brain. So it's found not just in the peripheral nervous system, but also in the central nervous system. Serotonin should be thought of as a very important neurotransmitter for control of the sleep cycle, mood, and affect. So when you think of someone who is depressed and needs antidepressant medications, they often would receive a medication that essentially help them to raise the levels of serotonin in the brain, and that usually elevates the mood. Um, dopamine, another very important neurotransmitter, found throughout the brain and actually other parts of the body. In the brain, it serves multiple functions. It plays a role in the reward center, in addiction, and actually for us in terms of pathology, deals with at high elevated levels of dopamine, a person can get psychosis or become psychotic. These are symptoms of a disease called schizophrenia often, which is where a person has auditory or visual hallucinations and delusions. Uh, as these psychotic episodes against high elevated level of dopamine and sharply decreased level of dopamine in certain parts of the brain uh, damages the movement control centers and causes Parkinson's-like symptoms. GABA, the last neurotransmitter, acts to calm the nerves down, so essentially has this kind of uh, calming, uh, relaxing effect on the nervous system. If the nervous system, the neurons are firing too fast, a lot of electrical activities that happens during like seizures or epilepsy, GABA often has a calming effect to settle it down to kind of stop the seizures uh, and essentially is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. All the other ones are primarily activating, stimulating activity, and the ones that inhibit it is the GABA. For the next uh, chapter, chapter 12, for the sensory mechanisms, we're going to basically talk about what kind of receptors are found throughout the body that help us deal with transmission of the sensation through the sensory neurons. We have mechanoreceptors, thermoreceptors, photoreceptors, pain receptors, and chemoreceptors. Mechanoreceptors are those receptors that deal with processing of hearing, balance information, which is all found in the inner ear deep inside and will be processed in the temporal lobes, like we said before, and also touch information in your fingers and in the skin will be transmitted through the mechanoreceptors. Again, mechanoreceptors, mechanical movements essentially occurring through there in the molecule, transmitting the information to the neurons. Thermoreceptors deal with temperature, right? Thermo means temperature, so temperature sensation. Again, it's very important, obviously, 
um, and the body cannot the body cannot have a very uh, precise measurement of temperature so when we touch something very hot or very cold we don't know exactly what the temperature is but we know when it becomes painful for us right so important information is sent to the brain to let us know that something is dangerous photoreceptors deal with vision so they're found in the retina rods and cones two types of photoreceptors rods are the most important ones and uh, the most abundant they deal with contrast and black and white vision and then the cones help us interpret color vision information together they're combined in the retina to transmit information to the occipital lobe in the brain where the primary visual cortex is located to process eyesight and vision information pain receptors or nociceptors we deal with pain information there are two main types of pain that are transmitted throughout the body. One is nociceptive type of pain. This is the pain when you're touching like a hot stove or when you're touching like a needle accidentally and you feel pain. And another type of pain is a neuro, neu um, basically neuralgia type pain. Um, and actually where the actual nerve is disturbed, so something like a lower back pain and the nerves are being compressed and that kind of pain, again, not transmitted through regular pain receptors like that, but through kind of uh, other means. And the last one, chemoreceptors for taste and smell, right? So small chemicals are recognized here. Smell is the olfactory sensation in the nose. So there are nerves that uh, connect to these receptors and transmit different odors, whether they're pleasant or unpleasant. Uh, then transmitted as these small chemicals binding to the chemoreceptors and going to the brain for interpretation of different odors. And for the taste, we have taste buds on our tongue and in the oral cavity to transmit taste information. Remember, the five tastes are sour, sweet, salty, bitter, and umami. These five proven tastes exist in the oral cavity, right, in the taste buds transmitted through the chemoreceptors. And when we combine some of the information from both of these chapters, we get some of the disorders here. There's quite a lot of different disorders in the nervous system. Some of them will be discussed also later on, or maybe were mentioned already. Uh, uh, I can separate these very quickly through the acquired nervous system disorders, infectious disorders, neoplastic, which means cancer essentially, and other, or like a miscellaneous category. For the acquired disorders, we are talking about primarily traumatic brain injury, TBI, and spinal cord injury. TBI is unfortunately uh, quite common due to either sports injury to the head. Remember, right, there is the cerebrospinal fluid, the liquid that protects the brain. Uh, when we're thinking of the brain, right, the best way to think about it, right, so we have the skull that protects it. When we remove the skull, deep inside there's gonna be uh, three coverings, dura matter, arachnid matter and pia matter, these are the meninges that protect the brain. And once you remove them, the rest is the liquid there that protects the actual brain itself. The liquid is the cerebrospinal fluid. When an injury, high force impact occurs on the brain, it could cause neurons to die, bleeding can occur, and because the skull has very little space to allow the brain to expand during swelling or accumulated blood cannot really go anywhere, that often causes pressure on the brain, causing severe injury, uh, in most severe cases, the person might either die instantly or go into a coma uh, for a long time and essentially often causes irreversible brain injury. Again, very, very serious consequences, very difficult to treat TBI. And spinal cord injury, this is you're thinking about some kind of a transection or damage in the spinal cord. The higher the level of the injury, the more severe the effect. So for someone who is paralyzed, like quadriplegic, either completely paralyzed or partially paralyzed and is in a wheelchair, for instance, cannot walk, but is still able to use their upper body. Uh, it depends on the level of the injury that has occurred. Again, the higher the injury, the more destabilizing and the more traumatic the event. Uh, and again, very difficult to treat, uh, of essentially long-term chronic injuries. For the infections, Again, uh, we're going to talk about, in the lab, we're going to talk about meningitis, which is infection of the meninges, those coverings of the brain. Uh, but if the actual brain gets involved, we have encephalitis. Uh, encephalitis, again, is a viral disorder primarily. Um, 
because any part of the brain can be infected, can be inflamed, essentially the symptoms are myriad and could be come from anything to be from like a weakness to muscle spasms to hallucinations to personality changes to memory problems to uh, stroke-like or seizure-like episodes again really variable uh, often encephalitis needs to be treated in the hospital quite severe disorders they're not very common again viral primarily uh, some are due to mosquitoes like West Nile encephalitis uh, some are due to other vectors. Uh, a very unique type of and the most severe type of encephalitis is rabies. Rabies is the one we associate with dog bites. In the United States they're primarily associated with raccoon bites and bites from bats. Uh, so rabies virus, depending on where it entered the body, takes a slow path through the nerves to towards the brain. Once it enters the brain and symptoms appear uh, such as hydrophobia, difficulty swallowing, uh, personality changes, psychosis, and essentially symptoms of like insanity, uh, then the person can no longer be treated and is considered kind of beyond hope. Uh, before symptoms appear, rabies can still be treated and important immunoglobulins against rabies can be provided. Again, it's fairly rare disorder in the United States. Uh, we associate with here with raccoon bites, bites from bats, certain other animals. Not so much dog bites like it is in some other countries. Again, very severe type of encephalitis, again, viral type of encephalitis. Um, and then for the miscellaneous disorder for epilepsy, we're essentially uh, talking about different types of seizures. Seizures are uncontrolled electrical discharges throughout the brain. They can be localized. Uh, so these are partial seizures. They could be uh, throughout the entire brain. These would be generalized seizures. Those that are often the generalized one often cause loss of consciousness. Any kind of seizure usually causes muscle spasms and uncontrollable muscle movements when a person either loses consciousness, falls on the floor, uh, can be incontinent of urine or feces, and often does not remember what happened to them. And there's other types of epilepsy like absence seizures tonic-clonic, myoclonic, and many others. For all types of epilepsy, treatment is absolutely necessary. First, with medication to control the episodes, to reduce the number of episodes that occur in the patient, uh, and sometimes even surgical and other kind of more drastic measures need to be taken. For the other two disorders, Parkinson's is a movement disorder, uh, where essentially certain parts of the brain, especially in the midbrain, are affected affecting primarily the dopaminergic system where the dopamine is released. So often not enough dopamine is found in those neurons and it causes um, slowing down of movement. So brachykinesia, um, cogwheel rigidity, tremors, pill rolling tremors, changes in the face, personality changes, often depression. Uh, again, Parkinson's disease usually starts out later in life slow progressing chronic disorder uh, we do not have a cure for there are treatments that are available usually that increase the dopamine levels in the brain for the alzheimer's disease this is primarily a dementia one of the most common types of dementia where there's essentially severe chronic progressive memory loss uh, acetylcholine is one of the main neurotransmitters affected there again we have no cure treatment is available Alzheimer's patients often either associate with those who are forgetting where they live, do not recognize their family members eventually, have trouble with activities of daily living, and other kind of basic uh, common issues like that. So again, Parkinson's deals with movement and essentially movement disorder. Alzheimer's is a memory type disorder, so causing dementia. Treatment for Alzheimer's is available to some extent and is effective uh, but does not completely slow down the disorder or eliminate all the symptoms. But the research is ongoing to find out new treatments and to make new breakthroughs to hopefully uh, eliminate these conditions in the future. For the last disorder, the neuroplastic, when you hear neuroplastic, you should be thinking of cancer tumors. Now, they are benign tumors and they're malignant tumors. For the nervous system, both kinds of tumors are really bad because, again, like I said before, the skull is a very confined space so anything that's growing in the brain in the skull 
will cause problems because it has essentially nowhere to go since the skull cannot open up to allow more space to be increased. Um, when we're thinking of brain tumors, again, whether they're benign or malignant, the neurons are not involved here. They are damaged eventually by the cancer, but they are not the ones that are replicating uncontrollably like other cells within the cancer. The cells that are actually cancerous are the neuroglial cells, those support cells we talk about, uh, whether astrocytes are undergoing uncontrolled cell divisions and becoming cancerous or other types of neuroglial cells. That's the ones that are creating problems in a brain tumor. Again, make sure to look at the class notes on Blackboard and read both of these chapters to find out more and uh, review the nervous system and sensory mechanisms material.